Since the mid-1800s, the numerous fossils of a bizarre reptile had been found around the mountainous parts of Europe. Because of the strangeness of its body shape, it was misidentified on multiple occasions. For instance, the fossil of this creature found in Switzerland were once mistaken for a pterosaur. However, it was later realised that the long hollow bones, thought to be the wing bone of a pterosaur, were actually the elongated neck of an ancient reptile called Tanistrophius. Tanistrophius was a large animal, being about as long as a saltwater crocodile. Only half of its entire body length was made up by its head and neck. Its long neck made it look a lot like the marine reptiles, the plesiosaurs, only it had strong legs and could walk on land, meaning it had to hold up its enormous neck above the ground without the aid of water. So it was more like a sauropod. However, it wasn't using its long neck to reach up to get leaves off the trees, as it had the sharp teeth of a carnivore, and they definitely weren't dinosaurs. But what's more is that Tanistrophius fossils are numerous and have been found from North America to Asia, making these creatures one of the most common large animals of their day. So whatever they were doing, it made them very successful. So what were they? And why did they have such long necks? During the Triassic, when Tanistrophius was at large, about 240 million years ago, the dust clouds were still clearing from when life on Earth nearly ended, as the Permian period came to a close with a natural disaster that caused the extinction of as much as 80% of land species. The surviving animal groups were able to enjoy a brief period of time where there was very little competition, and so spread out across the world unopposed. Because of this, the evolutionary solutions that animals settled on to survive were not as heavily under pressure from the competition of other creatures. And so for the first half of the Triassic, many ecosystems were hot breeding grounds for experiments of nature, unlike anything living before or after. For instance, there was an animal called Charavipteryx that would have glided through the air, but unlike almost every other animal that glides or flies, its tools for staying airborne were on its hind limbs rather than its forelimbs. The name Charavipteryx meaning footwing. And there were also the strange tree-climbing reptiles known as the trypanosaurs, that had a horn at the end of their tail, and due to the thickness of the base of the tail, and the way it seemed to be slightly coiled, it is thought that they may have been able to hang from it, and of course, it was also at this time when the earliest dinosaurs made their first appearance. So Tanistrophius may have been strange animals, but they had no shortage of company from other strange animals during the Triassic period. Tanistrophius was in a family of other long neck reptiles known as the Tanistrophiids. They contained other animals like the tiny Cosasaurus that could fit in the palm of your hand to the larger lizard like Macrocnemus. The exact relationship of the Tanistrophiids to other reptiles isn't fully understood, but it is thought that they were protorosaurs, that were one of the most common groups of reptiles in the Triassic. The protorosaurs were once thought to be the ancestors of lizards the name Proterosauria literally meaning before lizard. However, this is now known not to be the case, and evidence shows that the Proterosaurs are archosauromorphs, which are reptiles more closely related to the archosaurs, birds and crocodiles, than they are to lizards and snakes. Most Proterosaurs had long necks, although they were not unusually long, and were probably similar in length to today's monitor lizards, which was the same for certain Tanistrophiids like Macrocnemus. However, Tanistrophius took this neck and elongated it several times over. One of the main differences between Tanistrophius and Macrocnemus was that there is a lot of evidence tying Tanistrophius to aquatic habitats, whereas Macrocnemus was a land animal. During the Triassic, Alpine Europe was a coastline that had many rivers and estuaries running through it, and the remains of Tanistrophius had been found beside aquatic animals, like giant amphibians or marine reptiles. Additionally, the teeth of Tanistrophius were not just sharp, but were interlocking and very small, being the kind of teeth that you see on fish-eating animals, so they can tightly grip slippery prey. And Tanistrophius as a fish-eater can be confirmed, as there have been fossilised fish remains found inside the stomachs of Tanistrophius specimens. And for these reasons, there is little doubt that Tanistrophius's lifestyle was in some way linked to the water. If Tanistrophius was an aquatic swimming animal, it would make a lot of sense, because the only group of animals that in any way bear resemblance to the Tanistrophiids are the plesiosaurs, that were of course aquatic animals and had incredibly long necks. Different plesiosaurs are thought to have used their necks for different reasons, but one of the main theories is that they gave them a few more seconds to snatch a fish from a shoal before the fish were able to detect the vibrations from their bodies but there are problems with the view that Tanistrophius was a strong swimmer. 
there was actually another very long-necked tanistrophiid that was highly aquatic, called Dinocephalosaurus, known from Triassic China about 245 million years ago. Dinocephalosaurus looked a lot like Tanistrophius, with similarly enormous necks, but was about half the size, and more importantly, had much broader and more paddle-like limbs that sat in a better position on the body for swimming. So we know what an aquatic version of Tanistrophius should look like, and the real Tanistrophius didn't fit the bill. Tanistrophius' body was the wrong shape and too inflexible to be able to flex through the water like a crocodile, and there has been no evidence that the creature had some sort of tail fluke that would make up for its small tail. But also, rather surprisingly, its limbs were quite long and slender, which is bad for paddling through the water, but good for walking across land. Some of the earliest assumptions about Tanistrophius dating back to its discovery were that its head would have made the animal too cumbersome to walk on land, and therefore must have been almost exclusively tied to the water. However, although it may have looked like it would have been very awkward on land, the neck probably wasn't as much of a hindrance to its mobility as you'd think. The bones in its neck were hollow and light, hence why they were first mistaken for a pterosaur wing and it has been calculated that its neck would have accounted for no more than 20% of its total body weight. Perhaps it would have been hard for Tanistrophius to pursue prey on land, but this shows that holding its head above the ground out of water and strolling down the Triassic coasts would have presented little difficulty for the animal. So Tanistrophius loved seafood, and had some adaptations for living in and around water, but probably wasn't a very strong swimmer. A different suggestion for the animal's lifestyle, made by the paleontologist Mark Witten, are that it hunted by anchoring itself on the shoreline or in the shallows, and extending its neck out to grab a fish in deeper water. It seems its neck was used more like a fishing rod, and Tanistrophius was like a Triassic version of a heron. And this theory of Tanistrophius' lifestyle seems to be able to make sense of all of the animal's strange features. However, the story doesn't end here, as there have been very recent discoveries that complicate this further. Among the many Tanistrophius fossils that have been discovered over the years, there have also been many smaller specimens that are around 2 meters long. For a long time, these were just thought to be juveniles. However, study of their skulls shows that the smaller Tanistrophius have very different teeth, with the teeth at the back of their mouth being made up of three points, whereas the adults have singular pointed teeth. And there was also evidence showing that the smaller species were fully mature, and didn't have any more growing to do meaning that they weren't juveniles, and were actually just a completely different species. And due to the difference in tooth structure, it is likely that smaller species had a different diet, and since they shared a habitat, may have occupied a different niche, and lived in a different way. So making sense of Tanistrophius' neck has led them to be mistaken for pterosaur wings to thinking that they would have not been able to leave the water. But in the end, it seems that their long necks were actually quite versatile, and different species may have used them in different ways. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons for supporting the channel, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you enjoy content like this, then consider supporting the channel as well.